My name is Angela Keaton. I work for, uh, my day job is at antiwar.com. And while some of what I talk about will have some bearing and connection and is informed by that, I'm also here just as an ordinary uh, second generation anarchist who talks about these things and let myself think about these things for a long time, rightly, wrongly, up and down. Um, this speech today is part of a continuing thought experiments that I started because I went through some real changes in my philosophy, in my view of how my liberty libertarianism was expressed or the way I applied libertarianism after working very narrowly focused in the anti-war movement now for more or less the past five or six years. Um, I was with, um, I started, was with part of a show called Anti-War Radio, which eventually became um, a show that was featured on antiwar.com, working with someone named Scott Horton. And then I, two years after I started that, I started working full time at antiwar.com which was an area, not necessarily in the areas that I was trained in academically, so I had to relearn certain things. I and mean, it made me think about libertarianism and our different approaches, right, left, right libertarianism, left libertarianism, and what we do with them. In part because after really, really thinking about empire, one of the things I came to the conclusion, and this is coming from, I'm more of an objectivist-leaning right libertarian, is that racism is a pillar of empire. Now, people are certainly free to be bigoted, but state action involving racism, of course, is part of something that libertarians need to think about because it's one of the legs that keeps empire propped up. So last year I did, did an experimental speech that I don't think, well, it didn't go over too, too badly. No one screamed or threw anything afterwards. But, you know, on basically focusing on racism, occupation, colonialism, and empire. Because libertarians don't often talk about th words like occupation or colonialism, even though those things exist and they're real and they're actual problems, and of course they're things that the state does and they're among the worst things the state can ever do. Um, this speech is basically just taking in ideas like how does misogyny, uh, the role of, you know, of domestic violence, um, homophobia, uh, and just ordinary, you know, in ordinary understanding of, of sexism and gender differences, how does that um, play with empire and militarism in our culture. And some of this has really come to the forefront as we're kind of learning more and more about Chelsea Manning, the great patriot, and she certainly is, um, that what these attitudes, how they allow things like empire to persist, or perhaps empire sometimes allows these things to persist, um, particularly if, if the military is still being used in a very cliche way of teaching someone how to be a man. Of course, of being a man, of course, the definition of being a man is uh, putting on actions and how it is we conduct ourselves and where we are in this point of evolution. So I did a lot of hard thinking about that, and that's where this is kind of going. This is part of the, I guess I call it the Pillars of Empire series and how we knock them out. I just want to start off with a few things. I realize some of these ideas are controversial in terms of our approach, in terms of, and some of the things that I'm saying are maybe different from what we libertarians, how we usually speak about these things. Um, I mean, and when I say, you know, I, for me personally, or me, I'm just talking about myself, people absolutely have a right of freedom of association, and they do have a right to hate. I mean, that's absolutely a legitimate emotion, and your right to exclude, and your right to have uh, collectivist feelings. Those are entirely your entitlements as a human being. However, these matters, when integrated and become part of state action, or that the state uses those feelings that people have to create policies that are horrible, I mean, that are of no justification in the, in, in the 21st century. And that includes things like, you know, we're still using clubs to solve conflict, and we're still involving ourselves in the conflicts of others without um, any thought of what, those co what um, our role in those conflicts has for everyone else around us. So I, that's kind of where I've been going with this. And I just want to understand that, too, um, when we're talking about, um, you know, Libertarians in recent years, since we've become larger and, I, and we're kind of growing as a movement, kind of the post-Ron Paul era, we still have a lot of people who confuse their personal preferences with ideology or as libertarian statements. And a lot of people think that, that their preferences are a reflection of the true, true and only anarchism. And that's, of course, utterly ludicrous. If you're going to live together post-state, and I'll say merely, let's say, let's say merely a libertarian society as opposed to an anarchist society, because we're obviously a long way away since most of us realize we do live in a fairly in a quietly brutal police state, especially if you're not, if you don't have certain class, certain race and gender privileges, your experience with the state is often fairly horrible. Um, 
you, you have encounters with cops on a regular basis if you live in certain cities and are in rural towns that are terrible experiences. And it's based on nothing more than accidents of birth. Um, where you may have been born, who your parents were, what color your skin is, and so on. Other th I mean, these are things that have nothing to do with the actual person, but, and one is treated that way based on, on those things, or we allow that to go on. These are discussions that libertarians should be having all the time, because it's all about state power. After all, the force of Islamophobia, for example, and people will say that doesn't exist. Of course, we know that's patent bullshit. I mean, you can, you can hide from reality only so much that we live in a society that has all sorts of racism. We have the ongoing Jim Crow crisis of the drug war, which has institutionalized, beaten, and destroyed black men for now 40 years. I mean, that's just a continuation of policies we've always had. And that's, you know, we just look at it statistically, just be a scientist about it, and also, too, be observant. I mean, observe the reality of others, and that your existence merely is not a reflection of everyone else's, but is, in fact, uh, just one of many different experiences that Americans have or people worldwide. And when I say people, you think about people around the world, because after all, the long arm of the American police state, which you know, has its kind of final fulfillment in empire and its occupation and its bases, where, of course, there's no accountability to anyone whatsoever, certainly not the people who live on that land, that that's certainly one of the projects of, uh, of you know, ultimately anarchism. But we'll, you know, I'm, I want modest goals for today. We'll just say a more constitutional country, maybe a less brutal police state. Um, and then I just want to say one more thing that before we get into the meat of this is that um, this morning, um, this is a slight off topic, but my boss would be very upset if I didn't mention this. Um, Barack Obama has decided not to launch a strike against the people of Syria this weekend, and has said, decided to wait nine days before the Imperial Congress can decide for us. So in the meantime, if you wish to call the person who is who's appointing him or herself lord of your district, whatever that means, call that person. In my case, it's Harvey Waxman. I don't know whoever your person might be, but call that person and, of course, you know, do the supplicant begging as we do in our society. Please, please, please um, don't kill a bunch of people on my behalf. Because, of course, you know, one has to be... I know, I feel, I feel it's kind of silly, right, that you should have to ask for, please don't steal my money to kill innocent people whom I have no quarrel with and haven't even met and don't know anything about for the most part, like most Americans. So that is something that if you wish to take some kind of political action, that would be something that we all could do. And, and I'm saying that as someone who doesn't vote and finds the whole system you know, despicable. But there are times when you might have a slight bit of influence, and this might be a time it's worthy to, to weigh because it you know, there are real consequences here. And it's not just that innocent civilians in Syria will be killed, but literally once Syria is destabilized completely, um, there's, no, there's unintended consequences, <coughs> toppling dominoes, whatever happens next, it could be anyone's guess. But it probably won't be good, it certainly won't be for our benefit, and it certainly isn't for the benefit of those who are living there. So anyway, I'm going to start right in. Um, some of the things, these are kind of sensitive topics, things like misogyny, and we're talking, and that's basically women hate. Now people say, well, what is that and how that's based? Well, we see it expressed in all kinds of ways. We see it expressed in the way women can be talk discussed in public as objects. And, that doesn't, that doesn't, and that's not a statement against sexual freedom. Every woman has physical agency and ownership over her body. That isn't the, the, the issue. But a discussion of, of misogyny and hate, a discussion of homophobia, which is an unreasonable, um, an unreasonable preoccupation with the behavior of gay men by people who are supposedly heterosexuals. That's how I would describe it. It's a, it's a rough, and it's a, homophobia itself is kind of a silly term, because what we're really talking about is irrational bigotry, collectivism. Um, for those of us who come from old school objectivism, we know what are the three evils, right? Mysticism, altruism, and collectivism. Collectivism, tribalism, racism, sexism, they are ways of evaluating groups of people based on perhaps your ill-informed prejudices, as well as judging every person in the group as being the same, that you don't see individuality. Now, that is normal for people. We do, we're constantly judging, and we're constantly doing collective judgments as a way of surviving. But when you apply those in the political sense, when you're actually using those as foundations for public policy, including the, the, when you're making decisions on the most brutal things that the state can do, like occupy, torture, um, you know, create you know, a colonial state, um, that's you know a very 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 real and dangerous thing. Um, when 
there's something called, uh, we have a group called Come Home America, which is a very, it's not left or right, it's actually people from all over the spectrum. We talk about being against militarism, not being against the military, because I realize there are people here of many different views on what the role of, let's say, constitutionalists, and there's anarchists and minarchists. I'm trying to be respectful of all that, but understanding that, you know, just because a, let's say, a standing army exists, that militarism is something beyond that. That's where we're glorifying things like military service, and I use that term loosely, as being some kind of special privilege. We create kind of a warrior class. Um, we talk about, um, you know, um, what is the thing? Support our troops. Well, I do support the troops with my tax money, and I don't have a choice in that. Um, the supporting the troops, of course, um, also denies the agency of the people involved who signed on for this. Now, it's incontrovertibly true that the military preys on people from lower classes, people from demonized racial groups, in order to create their all-volunteer army. Which is, you, know, you don't see people from the most privileged classes. You don't see what the Occupy people call the top 1% serving in the military. And they may accidentally end up at West Point, but that's usually even somewhat kind of frowned upon once you've reached that level of, of economic and social standing. But we, the militarism and the glorifying of that comes in all sorts of ways. When you're on Southwest, and I imagine some of you flew in from on Southwest, one of the things that they often do is, oh, clap, clap, clap for our vets. Now, um, they'll tell you as the plane lands, they'll do like a real clap. And I mean, to be honest, um, you know, someone whose choices were few and made the poor choice of signing up, I'm not sure exactly deserves a clap. I and mean, when we think about what people do in the military, that's not honorable or decent behavior primarily. And that doesn't matter how much you, you know, I mean, you can, you can romanticize it and justify it all sorts of ways, but it's a welfare benefit. It's not, it's not something one earns. No one's entitled to military service. And I mean, no one. And that includes whether you're uh, male or female, gay or straight. I mean, a lot of these things that, you know, to open up the franchise, while they make good sense in the short term politically, and I do support, for example, the repeat of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, it's one, a deviation from the traditional gay rights movement to support militarism or fem feminists to support that the idea of being equal in the military is somehow the goal of feminism. It's utterly ludicrous. There's no inherent right to serve in the military. There's no inherent right to kill people. And you certainly can't do that with my money. There's no, there's no justification for that. Anything you find will be based on superstition and not anything that's actually based in you know, reality. But um, as you see you know, glorification of that with the support of our troops, and an over a preoccupation with, let's say, you know, at the end of Nancy Grace's show, no matter what the topic is, no matter how far removed, you know, there's going to be a picture of someone who died. And I mean, these are horrible things. I mean, the fact is that, that many, that many American, young, young American men die in these wars is something that we stop thinking about once they become little sentimental objects, you know, the little sentimentalization of, oh, you know, with the flag in the back, and he was 26, and, you know, we try to make this as, my God, this, is, this man made such a wonderful sacrifice. And that's nonsense. His life was absolutely wasted, and his family's devastated. No matter how many flags they wave and try to celebrate and honor their lost loved one, there's nothing that makes up for that hole. That's it. You know, that's a, that's a horrible thing to happen to a family. It's a devast a terrible, terrible thing, and what an absolute waste of a young life. So it's 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 deviant. It's really a, I mean, it is a sign of it is a sign of, of moral deviance on our part that we can't that we can't see past this. But wherever you go, you go into Coffee Bean, buy a pound of coffee for our troops. Well, there's lots of people I might want to buy a pound of coffee for, but these people who live on bases, for example, live with giant shopping malls. Bases are gorgeous. If you've ever, you know, discussions of military bases, and I suggest maybe reading a bit of Chalmers Johnson and really look into what a base is. And not only do you have amazing uh, privileges on these bases, but crimes you commit off base are often easily covered up or not taken very seriously. In other words, if uh, soldiers go out and get drunk and pull a hit and run on some person who just happens to be a poor fool that happens to be living on land that the U.S. is currently occupying, there's very little accountability. So this is a privileged and special class of people. And it's, it's, not, it's not a privilege born of any um, achievement or accomplishment. It's merely you signed some papers and made some choices about your life that I don't feel like I need to support. Um, now, some interesting things have happened uh, since I started working on this particular project. And one of them was um, you know, the little bit of a discussion. We're learning a little bit about why Chelsea Manning has made certain choices in her life. And one of the things that discussing was perhaps that to deal with masculinity, to deal with a crisis of masculinity of some kind, to join the military. 
Now, what does that say, though, about what it means to be a man? And I mean, just I, I kind of shortened it a little bit earlier, but what does I mean? What is it that one expects out of the military that's going to make him quote a man? That he that one thinks that signing up is going signing up and joining the military and making these choices in one's life are going to create a sense of self, a sense of accomplishment, uh, self-respect. That to me seems like that's something that we should be constantly asking ourselves and examining. Um, that being someone who's part of a, a hierarchy where there is um, where people are expected to follow orders as if they're you know as if they're basic you know basically three year olds come on pick up pick up your toys come on it just doesn't seem like that is a pure that, that it seems like it's completely unexamined and completely thoughtless in terms of what it what, what it's communicating to young men like. This is how you know. This is how you become a man, and you know you're going to suit up, and you're going to obey, and you're going to do things based on um, <coughs> whether they be bizarre superstitions, uh, people's corporate interests, uh, big oil, whatever. I mean, there's all and there's all different interests that go on, in, in particularly in the Middle East and Latin America, that have very little to do with any of our personal interests and our and the well-being of the person, the people who happen to live in this country. Um, but the more I explored that, and the more I started thinking about things like um, the rates of domestic violence in the military, the rates of suicide among vets. I mean, the last stats, and these are the U.S. The United States government stats on this, that something like 18 veterans a day kill, you know, you know, we have a rate, uh, you know, kill themselves in different, different ways. I think that sounds a little bit high, but if you're looking at numbers and service, well, I mean, there's different reasons, and the reasons why people might kill themselves, and the reason why people might commit acts of domestic violence, the reason why people might get divorced, uh, why families are ruined because of, the, because of military service, are certainly complicated, but it does seem like a disproportionate amount of these experiences seem to happen in people who are returning from military service. Even the name implies, like, as I'm getting some kind of benefit from this. Um, so, looking at that and kind of ripping that open even further, um, when the Don't Ask, Don't Tell was finally um, lifted, which it should have been, obviously, because I mean, who, I mean, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I don't, I don't think the people who are the victims of the U.S. foreign policy care whether the person killing them is gay or straight. You know, um, and they certainly, you know, when bombs are dropping, they don't think, oh my God, these are Democratic bombs. Thank God, you know. Oh. Um, because it's a, it's particularly it, it, in the, the case of Barack Obama, we've the state the government the state has found a perfect cover, a really a new a brand new fig leaf for its brutality. After all, how can our policies be racist if Barack Obama is ordering them? Yeah, it, uh, of course it's not in the nonsense, and we can pick that apart. But I don't think to people who are not thinking very deeply about these things, would they actually um, would they actually go far enough and really ask what undermines these things. And when you cut back to things like, okay, um, for example, um, well, I just actually and I hit the racism point because I never really pounded that one. It, it actually had it gotten more complicated in my mind the more I unraveled it since last year. And since these things that we do kind of talk about racism, homophobia, uh, misogyny, and classism in kind of one lump for various reasons. Um, leftists on, ca on college campuses did that, and of course it's been entirely unhelpful ever since, but we're sort of stuck with that way of thinking about it for now, so we'll just go with that a little farther. Um, the policies that we have overseas also inform our police state, and then there's just kind of a constant looping of that. The whole stop and frisk phenomenon in New York, phenomenon in New York City, um, we do this to Muslims also. The New York State, uh, New York City PD, um, NYPD, uh, the, you know, basically admits that they think of mosques as being centers of terrorist activity. Now we don't have to do the substitution on that. I mean, obviously, we live in a, a Christian, a, a clearly predominantly Christian country, which. Not New York City. I'll get to that in a second. I'm very aware of what New York City is made up of, Neil. Um, the, you know, I grew up there too. Um, now, the NYPD that the, you know, mo the idea that the mosques would be center of terrorist activity as opposed to just one more place people worship or do whatever, they express their cultural preferences and various superstitions, and we all have them. Christianity is certainly full of them. Judaism, my own experience, is certainly full of all sorts of superstitious nonsense. To me, they all are. But to other people, they're sacred and important things. Not so much to me, but to, for, to you, that's, that's fine, and that's certainly your right. But the idea that our police departments would actually designate 
this particular category of people comes from somewhere. I mean, they didn't just they, they didn't just sit around and you know eating donuts and thinking, oh, we got to get them Islams one day. I mean, that came from somewhere. Those ideas, you know, are from are from something, and they're very real. And that is part of the system. It's the same thing as stop and frisk, frisk matters that you know that basically cops can shake down black men in New York City whenever they feel like it. It's a very real thing, and that's connected. And the militarization of the police force, as you know, these vets are returning, and they're going to have to return to some kind of job. As we know, the unemployment rates are very, very high as our economy has been slowly kind of collapsing in on itself. Um, the we have to put, you know, the state feels an obligation to put these men, and of course they come back, and these men suddenly, be, you know, a lot of men return, and they're not any more responsible than they would left. They're actually somewhat more irresponsible. They, you know, become irrational. And people talk about post-traumatic stress syndrome, which is probably a real thing, but understand that every person, in, you know, every human being bears responsibility for his or her actions, regardless of what sort of trauma one claims to have suffered. You still are responsible for your actions. But when people come back and they're they're violent messes and they're you know they're, they're complete train wrecks of human beings and they you know come back and they suddenly become now police officers so now they're they're expected to enforce the law and of course we can you know pick apart and deconstruct what that means you know what enforcing a law means who's who's actually being protected and whose rights and interests are being served by the by the cops. Um, that's a really dangerous thing, and if you read, um, you can read words. Uh, you can read work by Radley Balco and Will Grigg and others who will very much go into more detail about that linking between you know people come back from the military, they end up on your police force. I don't want those people on the police force. I live in Los Angeles. I love L.A. I'm an urban person, but LAPD is one of the things that makes L.A. a dangerous place to live. You, you're taking your chances. I mean, I, people who are from LA are nodding their heads. Like you, you literally are taking your chances by, by, or in Las Vegas for another place where it's very, very dangerous to be a human being on the street. You're taking your chances with cops. And these cops have already spent years, let's say, in Iraq where, um, this is a, it's a very devastating story. You can find some of these online, but um, there's a lot of Iraqi vets who talk about their experiences, or, you know, what they did and how they feel about it after the fact. And it does change them. Um, as when um, somebody who's a part of a, the, the Veterans for Peace Board and, and works on peace action, who's an Iraqi vet, says, you don't forget things like the Iraqi widows you know, you know, throwing themselves in front of your tanks or whatever because they have no lives. They're totally hopeless. You've destroyed their lives. They've got nothing to, to lose. And you're going to remember this forever, these events and these things. And that does inform how people you know, execute the police state, how they're going to behave as, as cops. Um, and that, I mean, that should be the cons one of the concerns of every person in here since, you know, you all live in places where there are police officers since clearly we haven't figured out how to solve conflicts on our own yet um, in this part of, I guess, our human evolution. But um, that also, too, is part of the kind of masculinity. I mean, when you deal with police officers, you deal with people in these very, very uh, stark uniforms. You deal with them, they have tasers and guns and bats. Okay, and this is to, these are the people who pull you over merely for mis, you know, turning the wrong way on a street. I mean, this is what comes after you when you make a wrong turn. Um, that you're thinking that this person is someone who's spent time in Afghanistan and Iraq doing God knows what based on the orders of some other person who has a higher imaginary rank in this hierarchy. And it's all mysticism and nonsense. And you got this stripe here, that means this, or this ribbon hanging off. I mean, it, it's, it's nonsense. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't pass any sort of like really rational test of what, um, like, I mean, you really kind of take it apart. Like, why do we, you know, salute, you know, why do we call it, uh, you know, general so-and-so? And we continue, but these, these titles persist long after the person leaves that position as if it's some, you know, a divine, you know, divine title that one, you know, that one's granted by God. Um, that those are things that are all part of, you know, what I mean by militarization and then masculinity. And you're dealing with people who are in these positions, backing down or changing their mind or letting someone go for making a left turn or uh, improper backing or whatnot, um, is a, it becomes a point of pride. They, their masculinity will be threatened if they have to back down. And I don't know what sort of, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously we're all individually responsible for our behaviors, but what sort of culture produces that sort of madness? I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't even make sense on its face. Like, how could you even think that that would make sense? Um, 
So why it is we support militarism and why we don't point that out more, you know, what this is as a, as a bad mark in our culture and as something that, um, something that should be really a source of disgust, not pride. Um, and, well, then we can, you know, kind of think about, um, now, I was going to say, you know, I'm going to start with, the, I'm a very serious feminist, and I'd say a radical feminist, but um, feminism, you know, certainly is a lot to criticize. One of the things, though, were, the, were militarism. Everything is subservient to militarism. Everything's subservient to the empire. So everything must ultimately serve that. And even just, you know, even socially just movements like gay liberation and feminism get sucked in to militarism. I mean, what is one of the excuses that was used to go and invade Afghanistan? My God, we've got to rescue these women from these barbaric people and their backwards customs. Well, they have different customs than we do. Everyone on the planet in different places has different customs. People think differently. Every person thinks differently, all seven billion. I mean, they're not, you know, we're not the same. So, I mean, to even, to even make these kind of decisions based on, I mean, we make big decisions based on this kind of collectivist thinking all the time, but the idea that one must go in and kill for feminism, um, that's going to create liberation. My God, if we just kill enough people, we're gonna make them feminist. Or if we just you know, go into Uganda and we kill enough people, we'll have gay rights, of course, is absolutely twisted. And the idea that s these social justice movements can be used um, to advance militarism, should advance the empire, is a sign, you know, it's, it's part of the militarism that, you know, is pervasive. You can't really escape that. Um, I was t one of my friends did a presentation yesterday on, on schooling, and a lot of people talked about what it means to be in public schools or private schools or any kind of structured schooling. But I, one of the things I didn't hear talk about was what are the things that are actually taught in the classroom? And one of those things too, and this is taught in private and public schools and pretty much taught unless you, you go to one of these, a very unusual outlier, is that you learn, you learn a view of history, in America, of American history, where you have a sense, there's a sense of entitlement if you grew up in the US, manifest destiny. It's our entitlement to invade and occupy other countries. It's our role as the world's policeman, my God. That's, that's what it means to be an American. We go in and we solve problems. That's something that people learn in school that has something to do with you know, what it means your relationship with your teachers or whatever other things that you take from that. People learn that and they act out on that all the time. I mean, it starts, you know, I remember my father saying, well, the day starts with the Pledge of Allegiance is gonna be downhill from that mess because uh, he thought it was ridiculous that you know, you'd come up, you know, you'd make kids stand up and take some silly vow or oath, you know, five, six, seven year olds, you know, to some piece of cloth. Um, you know, something that those of us who are more atheistic and humanistic would say, like, what the hell is that, you know, that nonsense about. But that's how most days start in schools. And then from there, you're gonna have, you know, your civics classes where you learn how to be a citizen and everything can be solved in the voting booth. If you just put on a magic piece of paper and your choice between blue, green, and teal, and you're gonna sit there and, you know, knock that, that's gonna, you know, that's what you do as a citizen. My God, it's gonna make everything wonderful and right and you have so, you have so much say in how it is that your, you know, that your lives unfold because of the state, because of that. So that's, of course, an idiotic belief. And, and, w and once again, a superstitious one based on the, you know, the church of the civil religion. Um, I mean, more so than, let's say, you know, kind of a bland Protestant Christianity, you know, dominates the US, is sort of the civic religion of the state. You know, being an American, that's what unites us all. And what does it mean to be an American? Does it mean a love for the Constitution? Does it mean um, you know, productivity and innovation? No, it usually means support for the empire, which is bigger and, and, and seemingly endless and almost impossible to dismantle by its size. But we feel in that sense of entitlement. Um, now, people may be turning away from that. Only 9% uh, in most recent surveys the past couple of days support action in Syria. Um, which seems to make sense since very few people can actually tell you what events led to Syria and which side is which and what uh, interests are being served and what will happen, of course, if you knock out this person in office, what will, you know, knock, what will happen then, as well as all the consequences of, you know, the U.S. has had such great success in regime change and has had such, I mean, it's excellent, right, our, our record, or, you know, we could be no better, just look at Latin America, um, that you know, that we have a right to do that. That's our entitlement. You know, that's what it, you know, that we, we are allowed to do that because we're Americans. We're the greatest country on earth. I don't know, is there a poll that said we're the greatest country? I mean, did someone, did someone uh, vote? I don't know, I, I'd never, I didn't show up that day, I guess, when that decision was made. But these are the things that are taught early on. So military, you know, you're inculcated in those values very early. 
and everyone is. You don't really escape that. You know, you're watching television and you're seeing different, you know, the ways that vets are portrayed and, you know, you're, it's, it's deeply damaging and disturbing, but it absolutely affects our, the way we interact with each other, certainly when it comes to race, certainly when it comes to, to, to things like sexism and misogyny. Um, there used to be, you know, we don't talk about this very much, but in the Marine Corps, what do they call them, the Jodies, the calls that people do that when uh, we must have somebody in here who got sucked up. Okay. That, you know, many of them are filthy and based in some of the worst possible sexism. It's disgusting, right? I mean, but that motivates people. Men are supposed to be motivated by that. And, I mean, really, it's 2013. I mean, have we not evolved that far in terms of our interactions with people to think that that's uh, appropriate? Um, that... When Don't Ask, Don't Tell was finally overturned, people were coming out in the military. One of the things I saw was they would show these, you know, downtrodden young men getting on CNN and saying, yes, dad, I'm in the military and I'm gay. And they'd be like this, and, you know, and I'm proud of you, son. And not a question of, well, that's great, but why the hell did you just join a, par you know, a military organization at taxpayers' expense to kill others really should have been the moral issue and not... Um, you know, what is, you know, what is personal, I mean, gives, you know, no, one, no one ultimately gives a crap about those things anyway, but you know, we project that on like these are the most important things. But to me, it was like one of the things that, that came through was one of the motivations for joining the military in the first place, as well as that um, the idea that minority groups can advance and really they only feel integrated and truly part of societies if they're in the military. One of the things we could talk about in the past was, oh, the military was very important in racial integration. You know, we did not need the military to have racial integration. I mean, it didn't need that at all. That just basically is not an argument. I mean, it's, it's not an argument for how racial integration was advanced. It's an argument for our ways of discussing empire without, uh, you know, the ways of discussing the pros of empire, right? Oh my God, this is such a great outcome. Women can serve in the military. What a great victory for, for feminism and, and social justice. Um, that these are things that basically continue our actions. I mean, even if we don't go into Syria, we're still going to have to deal with this between 700 and 1,000 military bases. We're still gonna have to deal with the fact that at any given time, depending on what you're counting with drones, you know, we have between two and eight hot wars. Um, these are wars where there's constant, you know, constant US presence and action. Um, that, that's a reality, that's what our country does. And the rest of the world is a big place everything that isn't the U.S., there's a lot to, the rest of the world that isn't U.S. is a lot of things, a lot of people, a lot of space, a lot of squiggles on a map. So how they perceive the U.S. and what they think our role is, is, is something that we should actually take stock of, and that we're, you know, basically known as a warfare state, um, is, I know, deep, to me, deeply disturbing. You know, we talk about fighting the warfare welfare state, but we don't think about two, and I, I want to keep harping on this because it's a, a more right-wingy argument, and, you know, I don't want all the arguments for, uh, against military action to be from the left. But the fact is, you know, the reason that there is a, you know, a military is because you all pay taxes to that. We're all forced to. I mean, not that I think most people here don't choose that. I think it's, you know, it's obviously we're forced to do that. And it's very difficult to, you know, to live amongst others and not do that. But um, that it is a welfare entitlement. It is a welfare machine. And it is something that, obviously, if we need to put many people in there to keep our unemployment rates down, that should be a signal to us to say, well, why, what's so wrong with, you know, our supposed free market? Obviously, we know that that's what we currently have is not a, a free market in any way. Why, um, why we think um, that that's an acceptable remedy for um, our, not, our not freed market. And we should be asking the question of, well, why are our employment, unemployment rates so low, I mean, so high, and why are things so skewed that people have to join the military to find a job? I mean, you'd think that that'd be something we'd really, really, really want to pick apart, but we, we just kind of, oh, okay, well, you know, you're in, you're in, you know? Um, the, um, just think, I've, I've got, actually, I've got, I've kind of, I didn't realize how many more, I probably had too many notes here to cover, hold on. Just give me one second. Um, one of the things, too, when discussing, um, you know, even though, like, it's very much kind of at a left approach talking about, 
you know, how mil you know, the military creates you know, racism and, and various forms of, encourages various forms of religious bigotry and homophobia is also that if you're a traditionalist and you do believe in things like you, you believe yourself to be pro-family, pro-faith, military service is entirely incompatible with that. Okay, there's no, I mean, that's not a normal behavior. I mean, families are broken and destroyed because of the U.S. military. And not just the families that are killed and dropped bombs upon, but when the men return and they try to, re they try to interact again with, you know, their wives, their, the mothers of their children and so on, that um, it's obviously completely antithetical to what, let's say, Christians talk about in terms of family values. I mean, divorce isn't a family value. Domestic violence isn't a family value. Yet, that's what we have in large numbers, you know, we have, like, have in high rates from people returning to the service. So I don't know from any angle, really, that militarism actually serves any useful purpose other than maintaining a lot of bizarre superstitions and prejudices. And of course, we can talk, I mean, it's a different issue really to talk about, you know, the corporate and state interests that are maintained by the military. Because ultimately, that while that explains certain things, it doesn't actually show us the end results. It doesn't show us what we have in front of us, which is we live in a country that primarily, its ch primary job is to go and uh, create disruption, chaos, and murder in other places. And I don't, I mean, I certainly don't benefit from that every day. I certainly, there's nothing that to me, I don't get a benefit from that. I'm not safer. I, my life is more in danger because of our foreign policy. I mean, we have terrorism. It's a direct result of, you know, of our foreign policy. And it's just obvious. I mean, here's your grand conspiracy. People hate it when you kill their children. They have nothing but resentment towards you. If you kill their children, their mothers, their fathers, you leave orphans and widows, if you totally destroy their infrastructure, um, you totally destroy the things, the monuments to their art and culture and religion that they have built over time, they're going to hate you. They're not going to praise you because you, you didn't liberate them. They don't feel free. They're not happy. They're miserable. And they're going to let you know it. Okay? And any of us would. I mean, any of us in the same situations would feel very differently about that. I mean, if, if you know, and you know, use the expression, what if, you know, that, you know, now it's kind of a cliche, but what if China invaded the U.S.? and how you would think about that and what it would make you feel. And, you know, if they kept, you know, if people just basically were killing off 10 more of you every day, and so 10 more of you get, you know, get back out there and take revenge. And that's normal. That's not backwards or just because it's a product of Arab culture. I mean, all people do that in varying <coughs> degrees. That's part of, you know, how we react to things. So that's why I guess uh, I, I mean, that's why I was going to say going all the way back, I mean, over the years of my, in, in, through my libertarianism, why my focus has become much more narrower in terms of what it is that, you know, what police action I'm ultimately trying to stop, and that is the action of the state, um, you know, going and killing other people in mass numbers. Um, you know, libertarianism, you know, has gotten, you know, it's very broad, it's grown so much in the past few years, and there's a whole array of issues and things that, you know, that all come down to the fact that, you know, we have the state. but. Um, of all the things the government does, I mean, I can't, un I mean, you know, we can undo the taxes. We can undo, you know, the change in light bulbs, you know, okay, we can, we can go back to buying the other kind of light bulbs. It can happen. That can be easily undone. But I can't undo what happened in Iraq. There's no magic wand that's going to rebuild that civilization. There's no, I mean, and, you know, as one person said to me, who's a man of faith, had said to me, you know, God's not going to overlook what we did in Afghanistan. That's there forever on our record as something we did, as one more, one more group of people that came in and, and tried to destroy, you know, basically tried to, to destroy that country and the people in it and break them. Um, and just one more thing, because it's almost out of time. Um, I saw the movie Dirty Wars, which is based on the Jeremy Scahill book on, you know, Obama's uh, drone wars, very similar to really Nixon's secret wars in Cambodia and Laos, if we're looking at Vietnam um, analogies. But, those drone wars have horrible, horrible consequences. I mean, those are robots that go and they kill civilians. They break up wedding parties. They get, hit people at funerals. They hit, they hit children. They hit people's ha homes. That, um, in that movie, they interviewed ordinary Afghanis who were victims of U.S. oppression. And, obligation. and one of the women they had was in a full burqa. And from her arm movements and her gestures and the sound of her voice, and it was trans, you know, trans, but you, like, this woman is entirely cognizant and aware of what's going on around her. She's under no illusions about the world. She's just like any other woman that I know in terms of, you know, she's angry that her son, who was in the Afghani police force, was murdered. 
You know, he was like, and he was trying to be one of the good guys by kind of siding with the U.S. and still ended up killed. Um, these people aren't backwards or weird. They're different from uh, Western Americans, but their reactions are just like yours and mine. I mean, we all would feel the exact same way. That's common to humanity is how we react to, to you know, being, you know, having our relatives and families killed and having our cultures basically wiped off the face of the earth. That's common to all of us. And if there's anything that ending the state will do, let's hope that it ends, you know, the state going in, killing and destroying others, because that is utterly despicable and that will never be looked back upon by history in any way that's kind. So thanks for indulging me. Um, if you have any questions, I probably won't answer them, but I'll listen to them anyway. <laughs> Huge military town, Fort Carson, Tribal Air Force Base, the Air Force Academy, on and on. One of the major reasons people join the military is there are no other jobs. And so uh, while I, I really can empathize with 99% of what you're saying, mm -hmm. also being a feminist, yeah. and all that kind of stuff, but, um, there aren't any jobs. I mean, there just aren't oh. any jobs. 95%, I, I work for the last manufacturing company, and every other manufacturing company has left. There are small businesses, there's a couple of colleges, there's nothing. I have a friend who's looking for a job for two years, there's nothing. He's too old to join the military. So, um, what do you do? I mean, it's, I it's, it's a job, it's an employer. I mean, outside of, outside of all the egregious things that you brought up in terms of what the intent of the military is, and uh, we hear about suicides on a weekly basis from the military. These guys come back broken. They are broken. There's just no other term for it. They're talking about uh, giving um, uh, mandatory uh, help for P uh, PTSD because they all come back with it. There is no escape. What do you do? It's the only job in town. They want to feed their. They want to feed their fa their families. No, no, you're right, I, and I don't, have, I don't have a good answer for that because every solution I have would have to be undermining the state because that's what, of course, and you know, there's Federal Reserve policy and corp, you know, the cozy corporation. I mean, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what, because obviously we got to, I mean, I mean, they're talking, they're, they're talking about, of course, cutting back on the military budget. They're talking about giving less money and, and taking troops away from Fort Carson. That will uh, be devastating in terms of its minor economics as it is. So it's kind of like being between the rock and the hard place. Oh, oh, no, you're right. I mean, I'm not. Th all that is true, and I don't have a you know a solution that's that, that that's easy enough to undo it in this situation. Um, Butler. Yeah, you, you touched on and I know it's the time. Uh, the some of the problems you get into in terms of costs of violence that never get worked out of the system. And uh, <clears throat> I guess from a science point of view, you'd call this a form of entropy that remains within the system. And I think in terms of slavery, for example, which exists in the North as well as the South, but that's another point, uh, and the destruction of American Indian cultures uh, are forms of entropy that are still there. They've never worked their way out of the system. And if you'd like to see that applied in a military situation, there's a wonderful film that was done by a Canadian film board. The title was Aftermath the remnants of war. And it's about how lives of people are thoroughly destroyed. They, they, you don't see one single war scene in it, but you see you know, the story of farmers in France who periodically, uh, in the course of plowing up their fields, uh, blow up a, an unexploded shell and, and kill them. Um, you, you see the scenes from the area around Stal what was in Stalingrad. Uh, where even to this day, the, the remnants, the remains of German and Russian soldiers have been found. You just stop wondering, oh, look at that guy's hand, or whatever it might be. Um, I think these are the, the costs, the, the long-term costs, I guess as a free market economist, I'm kind of concerned about long-term time preferences. These are costs I think more people need to be aware of. It's, you see it in the, the soldiers who come back. and. <coughs> Not only commit suicide, but they, there are more soldiers committing suicide every year than are being killed in combat. Um, Ernie? Yeah, you know, the one point that I thought was interesting, and all the guys that are committing suicide when they're coming back, are the ones that are on the bottom end of the borders, 
that we're doing it. The guys that ordered them to do this stuff and everything, they're they're perfectly happy to go along with their lives. And I'm wondering, at the beginning, when you talked about the Pledge of Allegiance and you got the little kids going, I pledge allegiance to something, and where is the nucleus? Is there something that anti-war or the community that's working in? Because as we get into these wars, and we came in with Obama, and he came in, all the anti-war movement just went away. It's only you know, the revolutionaries and the you know the libertarian anarchist, voluntarist, anti-war. That's the only thing that always remains. And I'm wondering, what is the core solution? You're going at what age bracket? What idea? What? Concept, what non pledging is it? It's nationalism, patriotism. What is the cure that we can start raising a generation that doesn't jump right into this? Oh, it's a, that's a big, big, big question. And I just, the, I just, I want to get to one more because I'm kind of working on a solution to that. Gentleman, that, yes, right there. Yeah, I think uh, we're, we're heading for a real crisis with our young people. I, I joined high school, school bus you know, here in San Diego. Uh, in the military, I don't know what the uh, rate of. I'm an extra F non rate, okay? But uh, I, I don't know what the exact figures are. Maybe Butler would know. Gang members in the military, I think it's between 5 and 10% mm -hmm. gang members. I mean, like the lady was saying, there's no jobs. Uh, here in the state of California, the state just defunded the ROP programs. So the kids have nothing, you know, the ones that aren't going to the scam called college, they have no other alternative programs as far as apprenticeship or journeyman programs because the state just defunded the ROP programs. So we're, we're facing a crisis with our young people. Oh, and, uh, I mean, and I, as, like I said, I have no solutions, but I do want to hear everyone's kind of thoughts on this. Jill? I want to say that you say words that most of us are afraid to say. It's very hard to say to another person, yeah, that soldier, who cares if he can get a job? And I think that we need to be saying this. We need to stop people in their tracks. They're not going to like it when you say that. I can see on my Facebook uh, that one of my uh, high school friends and customers whose son is a career military military took offense to my rant on Friday about Obama wanting to go to a country and kill people. Well, I'm sorry if I've offended my friend or son, you know, but somebody has to start saying the people are going into other countries and murdering. I don't, for some reason, the general people don't get it. Um, I, I, um, I'm sorry, just one back there, and then um, we'll get right over there. Me? Yeah. All right, one thing that I haven't heard you mention, you mentioned the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, that's like a nice little indoctrination thing that starts young. The thing that I think really has more of an influence than anything else is actually video games. Like, I go to the VA because I was in the Marine Corps, and a claims uh, guy that deals with folks coming back from war was talking to me about how you get so many really young guys that come back from war that that like were obsessed with video games before they joined the military, and then they go over there and they see it for real, and it's obviously nothing like a video game. And then now they have like all these PTSD, like recurring nightmare issues, you know, because they actually have to watch over pits of dead people and get exposed to all this stuff. And that's another thing, like that's in, that's making people get excited, not just about the whole manhood ritual, you know, that whole thing, but it's also there's there's all this technical fascination. You play video games, it's exciting, all these different guns. Kids are growing up looking forward to that, and it's a recruiting tool. And that's another the drone, The drone operators, yes, sir. In your opinion, what size military advantage should the U.S. have? Uh, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if anyone really, I mean, I'm not sure how important if my, uh, you know, this, you know. <laughs> it seems like you're completely against all militaries. You know, I mean, it's... I can't you know, agree with all the things that the military do. But, you know, I mean, there's going to be, I mean, I realize this, the room is full of people who have different, you know, different degrees of, you know, where they want, you know, how big they want government to be. I mean, you know, maybe a standing, I mean, for me personally, I want to see none of it, but, you know, a standing army might be appropriate. I mean, guard the borders, you know, defend the borders. I'm not talking about immigration. I mean, just, you know, defend from assaults coming in. That at least is a reasonable thing that's defense. So you're not completely against military. Well, you know, I mean... I mean, it just. I will say this. You're, you're completely Sick against off. the military. Do you think the drug cartels in Mexico? No. Who do you think? Uh, wait, wait, wait. Sick off. You've got a tenth. Sorry. Well, let's see. You're crazy. You can't. Okay. okay. All right. Console. What I'm going right. to say is if in, a, in a world, <laughs> if there was a legitimate, don't you think no. that if we really were bombed here, in, or I was going to say here in LA, I forgot I'm not in LA. 
<laughs> don't you think if really people were bombed and we really were attacked, don't you think everybody well, I would but would drop what they're doing and defend us? I mean that that would be created if we really needed it. That's what I think. Well, okay. Maybe I'm naive. Yeah, I know I'm, I would like to see it gone at this point. The drug in our house wouldn't exist if not when it goes government. I'm sorry, yes. So, um, I'm just wondering like how do you think we should sell the idea of a stateless society to feminists because I was a women's studies call a uh, women's studies major in college and I was like the only one that was like free markets and like without a state we're not gonna perpetuate like a, a um, patriarchal society and that's the only way we can dismantle it is through getting rid of the state and like I but I but people would never listen to me and I have it out with professors. Um, so how do we sell that message to other feminists that think that the state is the only way to an egalitarian society? Oh, oh, it's, and you know, that one is actually one I do a lot of thinking about and other writers, libertarian writers like uh, uh, Sharon Presley and Wendy McElroy and others have done a much better job than I could do in just two minutes. But the enemy, I mean, it's impossible to have, the, the patriarchy could not have the force of brutality that it has without the state backing. And of course, I always use this, this is really vulgar, but like, you know, you look at the Washington Monument, that's like the big penis of the state right there. <laughs> I mean, you can get me more, you know, I just, I, I just like, that's, you know, not, but, you know, part of it is though, you'd have to under, you know, even though you get people to kind of think like, oh yes, women should be equal to men, or they should at least not equal to men. I mean, what I mean in the sense is that you have a right to be radically, uh, radical, women have a right to be radical individuals themselves. But, you know, that's a concept that, you know, you have to unwind all the other things that create people's belief in the state in the first place. And that's like such a hard thing to do. So you kind of have to just, I would go through empirical examples of what the state does over the years that has oppressed women, including horrible laws. I mean, I was only in the 70s where women in a lot of places could finally have their own checking accounts if they were married or keep their last names or all kinds of things that, are very, very new in our culture. These are only 30 or 40 years old, so, Butler? Yeah, the old, the old practice of that a married women could not own property in their own name was a product of state feudalism. State feudalism was a military system. It was a way you gave the, the, the eldest son got the inheritance of the estate because the eldest son would probably be more, be more inclined to go off and fight the lower Ruritanians or whoever the, they're going to be. He knew that when he came back home, he's going to have some property to enjoy. Uh, the, the women were not going to be going off and fighting the war. So, if you were if you were a woman, if you were if you were not married, an unmarried woman could own property in her own name. But once she became married, uh, her husband acquired the ownership. But you can't you can't disassociate that from the state. Yeah. Somebody's self-image has nothing to do with the reality. I have a self-image that I'm a 25-year-old guy who weighs 170 pounds, and I demand that all women see me this way. And I have about as much chance of that, having a cock and two balls and a prostate, as does Bradley Manning. And the fact that he wants to call himself Chelsea doesn't change the fact that over the course of a lifetime, he has about as, uh, as much chance of prostate cancer as any other guy. And I'm sorry, his reality of his self-image are two different things, and the guy is out of his fucking mind. Well, the, okay. Well, you know what? Gender you know what? is not a matter of choice. It's what you're stuck with. Gender is not. Biological sex is what you're born right. as physically. Just before we just let. What you identify as. Okay. Two different things. Yes, and one of them is for cops. Well, you're totally separate. Okay. Like okay. Well, one yeah, thing is. What, what did they have to it's do? demanding reality. Okay. All right. All right. Fucking ball. All right. Enough. All right. There's a. Okay. Okay. All right. The Fuck fact. You, bitch. The fact is a hero. Okay. Wow. I, when, I was, when I was married, <laughs> and I applied for a credit card. Okay. Because I was married, even though I was supporting my husband, he was still in school and I was working. I was not allowed to get a credit card in my name. I know damn well what being what what being criticized and not allowing to be a human being is like. But even as uh. Uncommonly accepted as my brother's uh, attitude is, he has a right to that attitude. As do we all. As do we all. No. As okay, yes, yeah, so let's all wrap it up.